All good? Great. Yes, am I audible? Should I shout a little bit more? No. Is good? Little bit more. Is this fine? <clears throat> okay, good. I didn't have the Rasamalai. <laughs> All right, guys, thanks for joining in and good afternoon. Um, so I'm so good to be here uh, back in in-person conference and uh, thank you so much to uh, Game of Testing so that we could be here in in-person conference and uh, I think Anand has already patented saying, can you share my screen or can you see my screen rather? I can't use that, but I hope the screen is pretty clear. And uh, again, thank you so much for joining and um, I'm Manoj Kumar and I work at Lambda Test as their VP of Developer Relations. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you know about the role developer relation, but put it short, it is an advocacy role where I make sure uh, the community interest is taken into Lambda Test and we build uh, products that make sure it addresses your concern, but rather not build on what we focused on. So it goes both ways, so that's what uh, developer advocacy uh, is all about. And um, into today's session, I'm talking about orchestrating your automated test into continuous testing. So how many of you know about continuous testing or heard about it before? Pretty much all of them. Okay, that's great. So, um, have you had any challenges in implementing it? Yes, no? No? Yes, somewhat. <laughs> cool. Uh, so, how many of you could relate to the picture that I have there? Is it, does it have some meaning and could you relate to it? Some, yeah, please. Okay. Fantastic. Um, I don't want to go other options because that is mostly related to what I had. So I was thinking of more around putting into seasons uh, because there is there is some uh, brown days, there is yellow days, there is amber, and as well as so the the thing that we're going to try and three is we going to have a green a green clean build, isn't it? Because that's what we end up looking. So how many of you had been in a situation where your build goes wrong and people say your automation test file go and check it out? So how many of you had faced that situation in your workplace? Most of you, right? Because people obviously think that automation test is the corrupted person there, isn't it? So how do we want to change that? Because that's where continuous testing comes into picture. Like how do we make sure we have our or automation test orchestrated so that it'll help you do continuous testing. So over next 40 minutes or whatever minutes we have, uh, so the idea is I will wanted to revisit a bit on continuous integration, continuous delivery, and then we'll see how continuous testing fits into the picture. And then obviously we wanted to uh, chat more about uh, the challenges of it. And then we will see some of the uh, tips and tricks on how do we, how we could avoid it. And rather, uh, if you're using any common tools, I've had some common tools picked up so that we'll discuss some of those tools and see how of those nuances can help you, uh, you know, do continuous testing at your workplaces. Right, let's get into it. Yeah. Awesome, cool. So first things first, as I said, let's revisit some of the basics. Uh, what is continuous integration? Does anyone wanna talk about it? Now you already had the clue there. I mean, it's nothing uh, new and nothing uh, groundbreaking. People have been talking about CI for a very long time, isn't it? So it's a three-step process, right? So you have a developer, uh, maybe happy or sad, and then uh, you, you know, you have a feature and you develop code, and then you push it into some sort of source control management. Like you could use uh, GitHub or GitLab or anything or Subversion if you're from those ages that where I started coding. And uh, you also have then a build where, of course, you want to make sure the features that you're developing gets built and then deployed into it. So if you really see, all of this happens through a continuous process where how do you make sure those works? I mean, that's where that really a testing comes into picture. So take about, uh, how many of you know about pull requests that happens in uh, those process? Most of you, right? So how many of you knows there is a test which will validate that? Couple of you. So the idea is that testing is there everywhere to put it simple, isn't it? So you have a feature. So as a developer, I might have a feature and I develop it and I push into the code base. So how do I make sure whether the code that I've written works properly as it intended? And also make sure it doesn't hinder any of the existing facts. And that's where something like a pull request validation test might help you out, right? So that's where things get, you know, you have a fast feedback mechanism and there is a testing involved. Now, going further, what is continuous delivery? Or rather, I'll put it, um, when you hear the word CD, other than compact disk, what else comes to your mind? 
continuous delivery, given because I already have the thing there. What else? Do you have anything else come to your mind affecting the CD? Sorry? <laughs> okay. Coffee day. That's CCD, isn't it? Uh, okay, it's closely related. Huh? Catch? <laughs> right, okay. Okay, we will see in the next slide what it means. Like, so there is a difference, right? So continuous delivery, you have the same personas playing a picture. You have a developer and then you have an SCM. And then you have a build because that's where your uh, test, you know, gets validated and then you build it. So when the tests pass, it go into, you actually go and deploy somewhere, isn't it? And then from there, you go and base, you know, deploy it to multiple application server you must be having. So there must be application version one, version two, and then version three. And therefore you go with multiple features gets developed. Now, going beyond, how many of you heard about the term continuous deployment? Most of you. So that's the other word for CD, isn't it? So when you hear enterprises or companies saying they are CD ready, which actually means these should actually be ready for continuous deployment, not for continuous delivery. Right? That's, that's the subtle difference between having uh, continuous delivery and continuous deployment. So that's the key basic thing that we need to understand. So if anyone asks you, uh, have you, or interviews, or have you been there, um, have you been um, you know, in a project that does CD or continuous delivery? I mean, usually they only poke upon continuous delivery because that's quite easy. But when things get interesting is all about when you get into continuous deployment, right? Because if you see continuous delivery as the video plays, let me check one more time. So continuous delivery, if you see, it's, it's the same process that happens, a code, and then there is a build, and then there is a test. But continuous delivery is all about you being able to deploy into production whenever you want to, when you decide when you want to go. But continuous deployment, there is a very thin line difference. So if you see the manual that was not there in the uh, delivery one. So in delivery means you have a manual switch box, something like that, where you go and deploy. Okay, this is all good. Like that is where typically teams will wait for some feature to be deployed. Uh, but rather in deployment is all about you write a code and you push it directly go into production. So if you ask me how many companies do that, I mean, it sounds risky, right? Like I write a code in my laptop and if you pull, raise a pull request uh, with the effect of having a PR validation test and some sort of other smoke test you might have, and um, how, how good it is to go into production. So there are some companies, for, say for example, I've been uh, hearing about the engineering marvel that Hotstar does, for example. Like how many of you have seen uh, cricket matches in Hotstar which scales as, as uh, you know, the users join? So that is one piece of an example. And there are many more companies. I've been a consultant in my life. I've, had, I've been, before Lambda Test, I've been at ThoughtWorks. I've been uh, at many other consulting companies where I've seen enterprises in that way as well as some war stories as well. I mean, as we go, we'll, we'll continue upon it. So, in a nutshell, continuous delivery uh, is all about you being ready when you want to go into production. And continuous deployment means we, as soon as you're ready, you should go into it, so something like that. And continuous testing. So there comes continuous testing. So how many of you heard continuous testing as a term? I've asked this before, but I want to hear again with the context of continuous delivery. Where do you think this helps? Yeah, of course, yes. <coughs> Anywhere else? Yeah, yeah, exactly. See, because if you see, continuous testing is CI, we spoke about it. So there was a build validation test, there is a testing. And then delivery, we spoke about it. And then deployment, so the testing is everywhere, right? It's like, it's like an error. So you can't get out of testing if you want to get into the CD way of doing stuff or, you know, DevOps way of doing stuff. So continuous testing is not a separate process itself. Right? That's a key thing that we need to understand. And it's, it's a process. It's a, it's, a, it's a process. It's a continuous part of everything that we do in terms of you know, agile way of development or DevOps way of doing development or whatever methodology you do. So we, we can even say the, uh, you know, the fund of continuous testing is all about failing fast so that you get the feedback earlier so that you know you can change course of actions and do all sort of things and and i'm sure you would have seen i don't want you to bore you enough by you know having a graph and showing bugs you know catch later you have the cost and all of that so i want to totally avoid that so now what is then continuous testing continuous testing is also not continually running your tests yes because there was a difference between having your test and you making it running and again i mean you're not running marathon or you know anything you know and we spoke about it so it's running, it's not about 
having your automation test and making sure it runs. Of course, if you only do that, you will only get flaky tests, that which is a good thing, but that doesn't help you in releasing your features, isn't it? So then what is continuous testing? As, as you said rightly, continuous testing is all about being able to test at every stage. So this picture is from Dan Ashby's blog about being able to test at every stage. So if you really see, you can test at all the stages of your development pipeline, being at planning stages or being at coding or being at even in, in the pre-production stages. So all the, all the ways of testing. So how many of you are being, or, or your tester, you went beyond doing end-to-end -end testing and contributed to other phases? So has anyone did it? <laughs> Uh, any example like which phase were you involved in? Uh, <coughs> Pre-prod. Pre okay, I mean that's still normal. That's what you're supposed to do. I'm asking anything beyond. Yeah. Okay. So after I hit the Play Store, ah, oh, okay. Oh, nice. Wonderful, wonderful. Any other examples? Okay. So something like a dev box. So instead of they pushing it to testing and then you test, you actually do pair program with them and make sure the features they walk through you and you test all the scenario. Okay, that is fair enough. Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Yes, yes, please. Absolutely, absolutely. That's great. I mean, it's great to see everyone has touched upon. I mean, if you've not done any of this part, I think you should be able to do it. Yeah. Okay, okay, got it. I'll speak to you more about it after the talk. But yeah, I think you get the point, right? So testing at every stage is very important. If you've been a tester or a QA, uh, or an advocate, whatever title you might have, I don't want to get in there. Pradeep spoke enough about it. So uh, the, the, the key message is here is don't just work on the functional test cases, right? So go beyond and see how much you can contribute to other phases of testing that you might have. Now, if you ask me, Manoj, can you give me a rundown of, you know, a, a user persona based testing that someone can do? So here is something that I, you know, took it from uh, a person that who brilliantly spoke about uh, how each persona does what, but also at what environment. So, just take a look quickly and uh, you know look at the purpose and then look at the task and then automation. Uh, to me, devs and testers are pretty usual. There's nothing big about it. And the interesting piece here is all about what happens in test and ops. And, and that's exactly what uh, we have to look for, which doesn't happen usually in companies where they claim they have to do it. Like they actually do it. Because there is a role ops, which they predominantly play. And then DevOp, developers will actually get into ops and they do some of that stuff and uh, your testers doesn't get a chance to do it. And Mahesh gave a talk ex uh, yesterday about building an infrastructure for yourself, which is great. And I've, got, and I've given a similar talk around it in Tokyo on, uh, it's a title automated testing in the age of container cluster, which, which sort of uh, does the same thing. And uh, what, do you, what do you, so the, the freedom or the ability that, that you can do in pre-production and production really matters. Like if you're not having some of that, I think you should go and claim for that. And that's the, you know, one of the key messages that I wanted to leave with. So what are, what are the things that you could do at production or pre-production? I think we can have a greater conversation after the talk, but at a, at a nutshell, these are the things, like validate system on a environment that is close to production. So someone spoke about after production, what happens? So it could be more about you having some sort of synthetic monitoring tests or, uh, you know, downloading the app from Play Store and then you testing it manually. So there are a number of things that we could do, but not everyone has an opportunity to do every time of that. So that's something that we should start doing. So then what is really continuous te testing? Is it, do you mean that continuous testing is all about using test automation? Because that's where eventually we sp speak about, right? So testing at every stage is there, automation test is there, and then we spoke about uh, hooks, uh, PR validation tests, a lot of things are there. Is really continuous testing test automation? The answer is no. Test automation is, sorry, continuous testing is not test automation. So what else? It actually goes beyond that. So automation testing is actually a subset of a larger <coughs> paradigm, which is called continuous testing. So if you see this, that's a definition, right? So continuous testing is, a, as I said, it's a, it's a testing process overall, where it will help you improve the quality of your product continually. Test automation is probably a tool which will help you automate a repetitive task. Let's go back to 
are fundamentals, right? So what is automation testing? So you automate the manual laborious task so that it gets automated repetitively. So that is what test automation is all about. Continuous testing, there is a difference. So how do you use them effectively and knowing what to do at what stage really matters. Then here is some more definition, like some more purposes and prerequisites. I'm not going to touch at all of it. So I just wanted to touch base on definition and what it means and we could take a look at it after, like from a prerequisite perspective, from a time perspective and feedback perspective, what it matters. Um, then what is it? I mean, I, I subtly told about continuous testing as a process, but it's actually not a process also. Am I confusing? No, no you're clear. Okay, great. <laughs> continuous testing is not a process also. It's a culture. It's a mindset that we have to be aware of and work towards that. I mean, we proudly say quality is everyone's responsibility. And there was a question raised in multiple talks yesterday and today also that how many of you are working towards it? How many of you are asking questions to it? Right? That thing is always there. But what do we actually call it? That is the culture, isn't it? But do you work towards it? So there is a story. I mean, if you're following Agile, that's great. Or waterfall within Agile, that was also great because it works for you and you're doing it. But what's beyond that is all about you figuring out you are able to continually do and test. Someone mentioned about DevBox. That is a great thing. Not many of you does that. Right? I mean, that's, that's how we should work with it. So now, Manoj, tell me, if it's not a process, it's a culture, tell me more about it. Right? So here are some of the things that I personally learned from my consulting experiences. So first thing first, you need to have some delivery process. Of course, Agile is one of the things, and DevOps is other way of things. So people say, what methodology you use? People say, proudly, I use DevOps. Oh, interesting. So you have only two roles, Dev and Ops. You don't need a QA then. That's the other discussion, right? I mean, that's how it goes. But Really, it's just an extension of Agile and then having an ops team exclusively meant for it. That's how it really goes in practically. But I mean, having Agile process will definitely help you with removing barriers, having that sort of communication, coordination, and making sure that feature happens and you, you know, there is a DevBox session that happens and you test it. But what's beyond that, right? So you need to have some sort of continuous integration setup, like ideally some tools like Jenkins or GoCD or Travis and Circle C, Azure DevOps, you know, we can go on. There is a plethora of tools out there. And then you are being, uh, you know, able to continuously uh, set up some sort of environments that you wanted to do. So earlier, you remember earlier we spoke about the freedom to create your environment? So something like that, right? So you need to have some sort of ability to set up that environment. So either you do it on demand purpose, or either you wanted to do it uh, based on, uh, you know, need basis, or either you have it completely open, right? That's also totally fine. If you have so much money, there are companies who have it, VMs always open, they have it always like using uh, e spot instances from uh, AWS, Amazon, or something like that, right? And then the key important aspect is the know-hows of test execution, right? So if I uh, may ask you a question again on, do you know where to run your tests? Where and what tests? Let's put the what and where of tests. Let's put it that way. What and where of, like, yeah, <clears throat> I have to go to the fundamentals a little bit again. So there is smoke testing, there is sanity testing, and there is regression testing, and there is a lot of testing, right? So ideally, and there is also end-to-end -end testing, which we call a happy path and all of that. So uh, do you run all of them every time? Okay, hold, hold, that, hold that thought. I don't want you to get in deep. There is a slide for it, and I'll keep you to it. And then uh, the last is, I don't worry about you shift left or right. That's a different conversation. <laughs> Doesn't matter to me. But I'm only focused on continuous testing. Whatever way you go, you stand in the middle. I want to do this way. Okay, please do it. But you have the culture. You know, have the culture of continually being able to test. Now, this is all great. Culture looks great. I understand. But what are the common challenges we have seen? Um, as we say, there is any new culture will have new problems. Let's put my, ourselves into that picture, right? Say, you're immigrant. Oh, these days we have a lot of immigrants moving into different countries. So if you go into another country, what are the challenges that you face? Of course, there is a language barrier. Uh, I mean, English is there for rescue. So we could correlate that analogy with some of the things that we have in tools also. But apart from language, there are other things like food, the weather, the season, all of it, isn't it? So there are challenges, of course. And, and if you are sitting on it, it's like sitting on the iceberg. I mean, it might look cool. But when it melts, of course, the man is going to die, just like the Titanic, which had no logic, which happening in the climax. So before I show what are some of the challenges that I've seen, and I wanted to walk through on it, 
Uh, does anyone want to share what are the challenges that you have seen? Challenges on continuous testing. I hope by now you have understood what is continuous testing. And keeping that in context, uh, please share some of the challenges. Anyone? Got it. I might have to slightly abstract that and say environment related problems when you have multi setup like catering to different user bases. Anything else? Getting the culture built within the team. Okay. You can't do anything about it. Yeah. <laughs> what else? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Absolutely. So what we said, you know, the culture thing has to flow through the system. Yep. There is no sense. We speak about something like Jonathan coming to the future, which is the start from the side. Yeah. There's only throwing over the ball, yeah. right? <laughs> Absolutely, I get it. What else? Okay. Dependencies and complexities. Okay. I think that's good enough. Um, so obviously, first thing first, choosing the right tool. Um, always, I like to go. Uh, reach the fundamentals first and then go there. So choosing the right tool is very, very important. Why? Reason, I'll show you. And then test data management, someone told about it. It's very, very important. And then we have lack of proper infrastructure and moments. And I wanted to be test infrastructure because we are in this conference and we wanted to speak more about test infrastructure because developers have all the pleasure and the ability to do it. And then someone spoke about brilliant point around complexity. So increased system complexity. What happens when it evolves, right? And then we have something called uh, processes bureaucratic processes, approvals. Yeah, I would. Yes, I can feel your pain. Yeah. <laughs> and then you have test orchestration. I'll, that might sound out of the box, but I'll explain and you'll understand the context. Now let's go one by one. So how many of you have been in this stage? What it means? Like burning your fingers, not knowing what the tool does. Well, that is, I'm telling you there is so many tools in the industry. And there is a conversation for another day, build versus buy. Of course, I'm, I'm, I'm right, work for a Lambda as a product based company. But people know me for open source work. I've been a committer for Selenium for 10 years now and a lot of other tools. Uh, but if you put me in that discussion, I'll probably say it depends because I'm coming from ThoughtWorks and uh, also and Narayan must know being there, done that for a very long time. And depends is one of the things that we do and it, it's a safe bet. Um, but choosing the tool, what works for you? but not choosing the tool, which is a buzz in the industry, buzz in the market will not help you. There is a lot of conversation around playwright is faster, Cypress is faster, right? Selenium is good. There are good tools out there, right? Like say for example, Sahi from Narayan, like I started my career out of Sahi. No one knows that, I mean, of course, second week I started using Selenium, which is the, the history, the next, uh, whatever happened next is a history, but there, there is a good tool. And there are other tools. So the idea is there is a lot of tools, right? So, or if you are in a situation, I've seen a lot of test, test architects in my client place where they might have chosen some language, some tool because they know that, which wouldn't gel within whatever is there in the, in the system. So the microservices architecture might be in Go language or Lust language. A test automation will be in Python for no reason. Why? Because it's simple. Okay, fine. But what happens when that culture, where is that culture thing gone? Someone spoke about culture, like you can't make that happen when it is like that. If you're doing it for your convenience, it will actually hit you and your team a lot. And you might find it difficult. I mean, people will argue, okay, I, I can't get a automation resource. I don't want to call it resource, but for the sake of simplicity, I can't get a QA resource which knows Rust language or Go language. Right, totally fine. Look at the fundamentals and hire them and invest on them. Right? That's the culture. So culture is not about continuous testing, it's, it's beyond that, right? That's again one of the points that I want to do. And then test data management, someone spoke about it. It is one of the brilliant pieces that we need to solve, and the industry needs to solve. 
which they haven't found any uh, good solutions to do it, right? I mean, there are some uh, open source tools which will help you do some sort of automated way of doing things, but that doesn't help there, right? So um, you might be, when the product evolves, someone mentioned about complexity, and I'll have uh, next slide which will talk about it. So the data is very important, right? So you might have some sort of mock. I think mocking is one of the examples that people use. Well, it's great, but you'll always have, end up with some sort of problems because testing against mock is great, but maybe at one particular stage or an environment, but what's beyond that? You can't use a mock data until pre-prod because you're not testing against uh, data that your actual user might be using, right? There is a lot of things around it. So there's interconnectedness. And lack of infrastructure, which we already saw about, right? Sadly, it's very sad, still the of QS has to fight for getting the test infrastructure, right? You spoke about it. So let's, for a moment, let's not only think about automation related test infrastructure. What if we want to do performance testing? What if we want to load testing? So we are fighting for getting a standalone QA environment. But what are the things that will happen if you wanted to scale up and do performance? I mean, there are, there are people are, are doing it based on, they have a performance engineering uh, team specifically, and that's, that's great. But What's, what's beyond that, right? I mean, that's, those are the things that we need to think of. There's challenges already exist. And then there are other sad bees, just like the egg. Um, the increase in system complexity happens, and tests at scale really struggle. So how many of you have been in situation or already had a thought about it? Like, when you've been in a greenfield project, like, say, suppose you start, and the product gets evolved over a period of a time, and probably you'd had a happy path end to end. How many of you know that happy path end to end scenario, which is the one that we usually test at all the CIs, isn't it? So which might have uh, you know, a couple of pages which you traverse through and you test it. But as the test, as, as the product evolves, the, so the complexity improve, you know, increases, like dependency. You know, microservices, oh my, beautiful. Like even driven architecture, it's beautiful. Like two days, I can you know, bring up a new service with no dependency on other teams. Because there exists a concept of producer and consumer. I don't have to depend on anyone. But having said that, that those things are there. Now, from a testing perspective, are you really going back and improving your test coverage? Or let's put it product coverage. That's a topic for another day again, but there is a difference between test coverage and product coverage, isn't it? Or functional coverage. So those things also comes into picture. So we should think about tests at scale, given the product evolves, and there is also uh, more complexity coming into picture. And I'm sure most of you would love this, isn't it? So I can see the smiles, yeah. It's great to see smiles post-lunch. I'm really I'm so glad to see everyone being active around it. So uh, bureaucratic approvals and processes. It's like throwing over the wall, like waiting. So let's not talk about, I've been, I mean, I'm telling you I've been in a legacy transformation project where I've seen legacy projects waiting 20 days for a pull request get approved. A, because the main person wants to approve on leave, or he's into pull into different um, project, and things like that happen. Right? Or let's forget about PR and all of that stuff. Come to the basic again, which is my favorite thing. How many of you have waited for days to get an approval to use some tool? <laughs> so many hands. So glad to see it. You're all in the same thing. So yeah, that is one of the things. Like, how do you, how will people believe and make sure you're doing the right thing? Of course, there isn't POC. You need to prove that. But even for, I mean, and it's good. People are embracing open source now in fintech companies, especially. And there is a concept called inner source where. Uh, for example, they take uh, open source tools and build it internally within their firewall. So they have their own versions of Selenium or whatever tools like that, which is great. But then there is other uh, things around, uh, if you want to get a paid product, for example, then a lot of processes. I mean, it takes 45 days in an average. That's what I've, I believe I've seen people are getting and waiting for that approval process. So those things also, also needs to change. And then uh, delivery pipeline, so orchestration, right? It's so good to see that pipeline is very stable. But not unlike our business, it doesn't like that, isn't it? You have all the leakages, like um, I don't want to talk about Bangalore traffic and all of it. Uh, if I'm in Bangalore, I would have easily picked up coming from Chennai. It's totally different. So um, uh, speaking about pipeline, I mean, in order to have a healthy pipeline, there are a lot of things that goes through. Uh, and, and the key thing that I wanted to leave here is that orchestration is very important. I know it's like an Indian movie where I keep surprised on what is it the orchestration he's talking about. I'll get into it, so don't worry. So test orchestration part is very, very important, isn't it? So um, which will help you do things continuously. So what is that thing? What is that gripping factor? Or what is that quality gate that does all of it? So we'll get into it. So this is all great. I mean, what's the way forward? That's the important question, isn't it? So I've been talking about 
what everyone felt and it's happy to see smiles. But what is the way forward? What are the things that we should do? As we say, culture is great, as I said, culture is great and uh, with new culture there will be uh, different problems. But we also understand there is no one silver bullet solution. Uh, take a look at this. I mean, Rajinikanth is everywhere, isn't it? So you can't find Rajinikanth for every problem. There is no silver bullet solutions. And this is actually a meme which came out when um, Corona was happening. And uh, they substituted this, whatever Mentos he's having, as a Dolo 650. <laughs> right? So, Dolo 650 was one coming. So, I remember I had like 20 or something. So, for three, four days, I had continuously in every six hours. I'm sure some of you would have faced that. Okay, let's not talk about those era yet. And uh, so, the idea is there's no silver bullet solution. There is no one-stop solution to it. Um, let's go back to what we saw earlier. So, testing at every stage is very important. Right? So, you knowing what to test at each stage is very, very important. Uh, you can talk about happy path scenarios, that's great. You can speak about performance tests, it's all great. But um, as, as Dan Ashby mentioned here, uh, you may be working on some of this, like between build and release, you'll coordinate and do DevBox and do all of this. But you being able to do testing at all of this is really matters again. Um, this is cool, Manoj, you have shown this second time, but what is next? <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> don't bore me with this picture again. So, this is one of the key slides that I want to leave you with to have a thought process around uh, how continuous testing will help you take into path to production. So, ideal way of that continuous deployment. Remember, I spoke about continuous deployment. So, in order to have something like that, so this is what we should aim at doing. So, being you being able to know what test run at what time at what stage. That's like one step, like probably a Rajinika, I don't know. Might, there might be, this is an iterative process. Right? This is something that um, I've open sourced it and, and I use this during my consulting days at ThoughtWorks and really helped and uh, we see some success on it. So if you really see, just to quickly do that. So concept, start development. Um, you know, if you're following Agile and BDD, acceptance just happens. And then you have unit tests and then you write code. And then, um, um, okay, this is bad. So. All the Ali code and Ali CI tools is highlighted because I repurposed this photo from my previous slide. So um, excuse that uh, caps, but other things come as a right code. You can do a exploratory testing uh, and then did it build pass? No, you know, you, you can go through all of this at your own time. The slides will be available. But this is one of the key slides that I wanted. This is like showing you the climax of it already, right? So now let's work backwards towards. So given this is the phase where we wanted to be there. So what are the things we need to do? That's the most important thing. So you can go this, you know, we can take a photo or a screen sh screenshot of it and share, hey, this is brilliant, we know how to do it. Your CXOs or your head of text might say, this is brilliant, let's do it. But will it happen in a day? Definitely not. Unless you are in a green field and if you said, this is the culture we want to follow, it will happen. Otherwise, it's very, very tough, I'm telling you. I've been in legacy projects which has been running for, uh, you know, uh, 12 years. And I had to look into the code which was written in PHP 4. And now PHP 12, 13 is there. I don't know how many of you, anyone using PHP? Ah, all right, okay. We are a legacy, you know. <laughs> uh, you also used it. So yeah, sometimes it happens, right? So, um, and then you go about writing. So how many of you know about characterization test? What do you mean? Sorry, you didn't expect, I'll ask you to explain. Huh? <laughs> no, 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 wrong, sorry. Sorry? No, it's a, it's a testing. So just like regression testing, characterization test also have its own meaning. No. Okay, let me get you. So, sorry? Oh, this is not psychology class, come on. <laughs> so, characterization test is a technique that they will use and test a piece of feature or code that you don't know what it's supposed to do. That's the brilliant piece. So there's a book called Working Effectively with Legacy Code written by Michael Feathers and he actually coined this term. It's a brilliant book and I haven't read the full book but just a chapter of it which was very important for me before I got into the legacy project. Because as I said, I want to, I had to test that unit, uh, unit code. I have to look at the unit code, uh, unit testing as well as uh, the integration testing they had. But I don't know what it means. I mean, all the developers who were there previously has gone over it. So that's where the characterization test will really help out. Right? So go check it out if that's something new. I mean, I'm happy really. Uh, that's one of the key takeaways that you're taking. <clears throat> now, 
we spoke about characterization tests for one of the things that we might end up like legacy projects. If you're in a consultant, if you're in a startup, that's great because you'll do all cool things. Uh, but hopefully you choose all the right tools <laughs> as we saw in the previous one. So if you ask me, Manoj, that is great. You have a complete flowchart of how you can do path to production. But if you ask me, if there isn't what we need further. So you actually need a test strategy for continuous testing, right? So effective strategy for, you know, a, a quality strategy is fine. You will have a de neat definition of what is the test plan and what sort of, what, who is the, uh, you know, author for a couple of tests and then who is the, you will have some sort of racy matrix and all of it. That's great. But if you look at the larger picture, um, okay, before I put into, uh, I'll refer to that, I'll ask you a question around. So how many of you know a difference between technology facing test and a business facing test? And give me an example, please. Let me repeat if you missed it. Technology facing test and then business facing test. Unit tests are technology facing, UAD business facing. There you go, it's simple as that. It's very simple as that. So how many of you are being part of that? So the idea, so if you see this um, thing here, so there is different types of tests and there are business facing uh, tests and then there is technology facing tests. So in a manual or automated, you have to do all the functional exploratory testing and then security, uh, all sort of scanners that you might use. But also in the business facing test, there is acceptance test you want to do. So people still confuse between what is an acceptance test, uh, user acceptance versus what we do. So if you take frameworks like Serenity, where I've been one of the open source contributor along with John Smart for a very long time, uh, is also that. So he, um, he still goes and explains how to avoid BDD feedfalls and all of it. So uh, people use a uh, classic Selenium code under a BDD framework like Cucumber and say we are doing BDD. Well, that's not the case. Uh, many of you would have seen that. So, the, the key idea from uh, this slide that I wanted to take away with is, uh, by the way, thank you to Nan Hugo, where uh, he uh, carved out this beautiful uh, cartoonish, uh, you know, uh, scribe of what he learned from test strategy as a chapter in a book called Continuous Delivery. So if you're looking for a book to learn about it, I think that's one of the great books by Jess, Jess Humble. Um, you could, something you could learn a lot from. And then, um, enough speaking about business facing and technology facing, there is something called Happy path, alternate path, and sad path. How many of you do that? Happy path, many of you would do. But how many of you do sad and alternate path? Sorry, you were relaxed, stretching, or you were answering? I would just say that happy path, you're sad. Ah, so sad. <laughs> what else? Okay. That's the key thing, right? I mean, I'll touch upon why. That's it's getting interesting. So, has anyone heard about it? Or alternate path, sad yes, yes. path? Okay. They are alternate path. What if, you know, in the process in testing a supply chain, so that's where we think of what can be done alternatively in the supply chain. Now we move the other route. And then sad sad path is okay, everything is going wrong. Mm -hmm. Then then what is the final outcome? How where do you end up? So we do also Great, great. It's great, I mean great you share the definition but it also matters on when you do it, yes. right? So if you ask Bridges, he might have his own example. If you ask me, I might have a own. But what it really matters is, are you doing it? If yes, it's great. If not, high time you think about it. Remember the increased complexity and tested scale that I mentioned? That's where this comes into picture. You being able to know what test and when to run really matters. Only then you'll bring in that culture. Yeah. Yes. That's why you have DevBox. So DevBox is all about not you developer just walking through what the feature he has developed or showing what test of what what are the unit tests that he had done. So if you wanted to check for yourself, you go ahead and do it. So you be nice to the developer and then behind the scenes you do all the testing. Not many people do that. Okay, we'll we'll discuss about that scenario. That's why I said like Bridges might have a story, I might have a story. So if you're having that story, I'm interested to learn about it so that I can see if there is any suggestions or I would have seen some sort of client stories around it. Um, so that's about test strategy. Now, um, coming to the core part of it, right? So what is that thing about orchestrating um, your automated tests? Coming to the crux of it. So these are some of the experiences that I've had and I wanted to share with you on um, how would you orchestrate all of this together? First thing first, um, ephemeral environments. How many of you know about it or doing it? 
if you don't know the meaning of ephemeral, it's it's a short term lived disposable things. Say Linux containers for example or Docker containers. So you being able to create your own and then disposing it is a liberty to have. Now you have. Ah, that's great. That's great. Okay. Okay, glad I explained it. <laughs> Thank you. So and then there's a thing about uh, you being able to create it and then dispose it based on it. Or if you're maybe in um, AWS world, there is something called uh, spot instances. You know, instead of you being occupying one EC2 instance for a very long time, you could open up spot instances for that matter. So using ephemeral environments is very, very important for you to able to orchestrate your tests. I'll keep it tests because business facing is there as well as technology facing is there. Like what's next? <clears throat> Distributed tests. You being having an ability to distribute a test, it's very important. Uh, it goes way back to my previous slides that I showed about picking up the right tool. It starts from there, right, isn't it? So all these couple of slides that I'm showing, you should correlate with all the things that we discussed in the past. So be it ephemeral environments, you know, you being able to uh, create and dispose environments that matter for you, or you being picking up a tool uh, where you'll be able to distribute your test. You know, uh, that is also one of the key things. Hey, Santosh. And then uh, test data management. We spoke about it, right? So how many of you have or used any open source tools or paid tools for that matter, to ability to, to give you some sort of data that you need? Awesome. Security evangelist is here and there's no doubt. Any tools that you might want to name? Ah, okay. Informatica. Informatica paid tools, that's great. Santosh, any options? Awesome. That's one of my favorites. Awesome. Glad you gave me the right time. Huh? <laughs> Making a superstar. In <laughs> right, yeah, those are one of the tools. And I've used a couple of tools which I'll actually share in the uh, previous slide, uh, the last slide as a reference. So that's something you could look at. So the idea is um, what we're going through, just to step back and revisit, how do you orchestrate your tests? Because there's a lot of tests. We spoke about business facing tests, we spoke about technology tests. Orchestrating is all about knowing when and how to use those tests. Because throughout the dev pipeline, as you saw, there is build, release, plan, all of it is there. But knowing what test to run. So I'm not teaching you, you run this test at this stage. So that's not my job. So I'm, all I can tell you is you step back, revisit, and know what test to run at what stage. And in those cases, picking up the right tool, distributed tests, and now test data management is an important thing. And very common topic, probably a discussion for another day again, like hand flicky tests. So many of you have been facing a situation where you run a test, it works on a device and a browser combination, but fails in other combination. Or maybe the same test would fail tomorrow. Most of you. So that's where that alarm or, or uh, at my workplace we used to have some sort of light. When build goes, um, you know, red, <laughs> the light starts. And automatically the team that will be called upon is QA team. Because they know only automation test will fail. <laughs> that's the perception they have, right? So we need to change that. And how do we happen is exactly by what we're discussing is a, it's a mindset and we have to do it. So handling flaky tests is one of the things. And how do we handle it? Well, there are different, I mean, people say retry. I mean, honestly, in my opinion, retry is not the best way to handle flaky tests. It will only waste your resources, isn't it? And, and how do you uh, handle it is based on you being able to work with your team and understand why it has passed in such a situation. Those are, that's why you have logs. I mean, how many of you heard about observability momentum? So include that in your you know, pipeline. See the traces, understand what is going beyond. There is going to be some resource utilization spiking up for some reasons. Maybe, you know, as we know, Chrome is eating up a lot of RAM. <laughs> it might pass, I mean, sometimes the resource might have spiked up and it might have failed. So understand how could you tackle those scenarios. And those are the things you should look forward and do. So when a test fails, don't retry. It's, a, it's, a, it's absolute setting up for failure. And next is fast feedback, and of course, the reason for doing everything is because we want fast feedback. People can't wait anything, right? Wait for anything. So that's one of the things that we are looking forward. So this is all great, Manoj. Thank you for sharing. And tell me some of the things, how should I go about and choose it? Well, that's not my job again. All I can tell you is there is plethora of tools. As I said in the previous slide, the, the, the one GIF which was burning the hand, right? So 
choose accordingly what it works for you. So there is different tools in plan stage, build stage, um, operate, and then deploy, right? So choose what works for your team and not what you're comfortable with. Don't choose Selenium Java for a microservice project that develops in Go. And if you're speaking about monorepos, like how many of you in a setup called monorepo? Only one, two, couple of you. So how would it work? The culture, I mean, if, if you have had a roadblock, how the devs will come and help you? He might be a front-end JavaScript engineer. Does that really mean I'm asking you to learn JavaScript? Yeah, why not? Go ahead and learn, it's important. That's how you speak about the common question that comes in, how QAs can improve skills? Well, by this only. Not by choosing what you're comfortable with, isn't it? There you go. Now, putting all of this context into test infrastructure, because that's what we are here to learn. So how do you maintain a test infrastructure? Well, we heard this concept, and even Mahesh on uh, yesterday, he spoke about building infrastructure. And then speaking of the paradigm that a lot of people are using, infra building infrastructure as a code. So how many of you heard this term, or can some name some tools? I, I couldn't hear you. Ah, yes, infrastructure as a code, yes. Any names? Okay, I probably haven't heard it, sorry. Yes, Terraform. Okay, so you get it, so some tools like Terraform. So, being more, so using building infrastructure as a code concept into testing. Because it's a methodology, it's, a, it's something like a design pattern. So, if you know what is design pattern, it is meant to be there because it can solve some problem, irrespective of language and semantics. So likewise, this methodology building infrastructure as a code is also for testing, isn't it? Because we can use it, which will help you. So why do we use it? So avoiding manual tasks which are prone to error. And then obviously, you have the ability to rebuild environments. So we spoke about ephemeral environments, being able to dispose when you want and being able to create. And then you also are able to simplify it based on some sort of you know, configurations files you might have. And then uh, some of the tools that I've named it here so that you could relate it are like Terraform, Ansible, Chef, Puppet. So how many of you use Selenium here? Probably I should have asked this previous you know, at the beginning of the session. Uh, how many of you use uh, Cypress? Um, Playwright? Um, are there anyone using different tool from what Cypro, I mentioned? Cypro, yes, Cypro. Huh? Test Cafe, OK. Puppeteer. OK, use both. Okay, awesome. Good luck, huh? <laughs> what else? <laughs> oh, what is that? It's a automated code. That's cool. Ha, ah, okay. Topic for another day. Thank you. Low code, no codes. I don't want to get into it. But yeah, if it works, that's great for you. Um, so again, so there are a lot of tools which will help you do that. And uh, will those tools be Will, will those tools gel with the same environment that you're doing? That really matters. All those tools running in what fashion? Is it occupying all your in-memory process and running it? Or is it running out of the process? Or is it able to you know, automatically wait for some things to happen, synchronization? So all of this matters, right? So use what works for you. So um, some of the examples that I want to pick here, um, since you know, some of the tools that I've mentioned, like Selenium is one of being common used. So Selenium Grid is there where you will use to distribute your Selenium tests. And we recently in Selenium 4, I have an entire topic on it that I gave in TestMew conference by Lambda Test, and you could go and check it out, where there's lots of things happening around it. We specifically built it so that it will cater to microservices way of development that we do. And observability that I spoke about earlier is actually baked in. So when I mean baked in, it's all about, so observability is all about two things, instrumentation and then visualization. So once you instrument, it will automatically collect. It's like a bus conductor, right? So you, you go and give all the uh, tickets. And then uh, end of the day, there will be an inspection uh, inspector who will collect all the tickets. So similarly like that, think of that. I mean, uh, apologies if the analogy didn't work. But um, that's how it goes, right? So Narayan is laughing. <laughs> we spoke at length about using analogies. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so that's how it goes, right? I mean, you, so the instrumentation is already done in the Selenium grid code base. So if you consume it, how do you consume it? Like, there is certain instructions that you have to follow so that your Selenium grid is up and running uh, in a way that it will collect all the information. And then all you have to do is just visualize it. And that's how it happens. Um, the same way goes with other tools as well. Um, then you have Cypress, for example. 
And then there is Sahi Pro. Uh, I think the expert is there in house, and you can ask Narayan about how really distributed testing happens in Sahi Pro. And then there is also Cypress where you speak, you know, you have parallel services, and there is also some paid features around dashboard where you can look it up. So the key message for this slide that I want to leave with is all about um, connect the dots that I've been speaking about in all the slides, right? So we spoke about all the things from fundamentals to uh, orchestrating with uh, flaky test, test management, all of it. See if, you're, if you have the flexibility to do that with your tool. If yes, that is great, because you're already in that momentum, right? So as I said, continuous testing is not a process. It's a culture. So if you have to infuse that culture within your teams, good luck, and you have to work for it. And what are some of the tricks? What you can do about it? So these are some of the things that I've practically seen it works uh, in maintaining your test infrastructure. This may be in context of Selenium Grid, but I'm sure this works for all, all the tools that you might use. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, means for Sahi and Narayan can do, and you can do for Test Cafe, and many of you maintain, you know, mention about different tools. So develop mechanism to handle crash processes. So if you're, the moment you're gonna run your test apart from your laptop in a remote machine, then you need some sort of mechanism which will help you crash, you know, look for crashes, look for zombie processes, look for dead processes. Otherwise, you want to end up with security loopholes. Security expert is here, we can talk to him about all the security flaws that happens in remote execution, isn't it? So a lot of things like that. And then use Linux containers wherever possible so that you can do all the ephemeral, you know, way of stuff. And then reboot the node after running X number of tests. I mean, no one does that. Back in days when we were, you know, before the container days, we had VMs. So there will be an admin which will, you know, you're, I'm sure you would have heard about or seen an exception, remote browser exception and died. Most of you would have seen that. That is because you're not maintaining it properly and something has happened. And again, you'll run to, you know, you'll try to execute the same test. But there needs to be some sort of cleanup that should happen. You don't have to wait for that ops person to do it. You can do it by running your own test. You're writing your own script. And then restart nodes periodically. Now, how to do it? Well, as I exactly mentioned, you know, you can write scripts for checking dead processes, you know, bootstrap grid with, you know, Docker, uh, CF jobs, and uh, use available grid hooks to set up. I mean, so for those of you who mentioned other tools, tell me if this fundamentals are wrong or right. This might work based on different contexts. Yeah, please. Yeah, absolutely. And especially if you're working in other hosts like Windows or, uh, you know, other uh, operating system, it might really help you out. So this is one example where you could go ahead and use it. So if you're using Selenium Grid and if you wanted to, you know, check, this is one of the smoke tests that you can do. So what you're seeing right now is writing a test for your product, which always you do with these tools, but are you writing a test so that you test your infrastructure? Because that is within your hands and you should be able to do it. And that's one example of it. This is a simple smoke test that we wanted to do. Does anyone understand this or should I explain this? Just making sure hub is ready. Because if the hub is not ready, the node can attach. Right? It's more like if the master is then slave, you don't have to ask. Like how the class teacher is not there, students will behave. Seems simple like that. And then um, we spoke about end-to-end -end testing so far. Selenium, Sahi, and then uh, Cypress, Test Cafe, and all of it. So we're talking about continuous tests, knowing what test to run at what stage. So it'll be, we have to think about integration tests also, if you look at the test pyramid. Right? We spoke about the test that in the top. So let's come back one step below and talk about both integration and unit test as well. So this is a beautiful project. I don't know how many of you have used this or seen this before, test containers. Anyone? No. Okay, go check it out. It's open source. Um, this is based on the concept of ephemeral environments where um, in one package you will get a complete, all, it's like one stop shit. Right? It's not like the Rajnikan that we discussed earlier <laughs> where you have the database it has all MongoDB instances. So anything that is available in Docker repository, you can bring that up all here. So you can bring in your test data. So some of you spoke about speaker, so that also has in Docker. So if you know there is a Docker image for it, you can bring it up in test container. So it's all end-to-end. -end. So in one container, you have right from setting up your infrastructure to building your test data to running it. Because it has an image for Selenium as well where still some people use Cypress and Selenium for integration test also, forget about the end-to-end -end test, right? And if that's the point, you can use test containers as well. This is again open source, so go, you can go check it out. And then speaking of uh, HyperExecute, which is a product at Lambda Test, which we launched, where it will help you, uh, you know, find out all the end-to-end -end test orchestration we have to do. Because the idea that I wanted to uh, again reiterate is, you're running, like, you must have run at least thousands and millions of tests in your life. 
right? Automated test if you are automation engineer. So what have you learned from it? That is key. So look at the history, look at the build history, what has run? Or there should be a way to identify if some data has changed, should I run the entire build or be intelligently identify, identify whether I need to run only a subset of tests for which data has changed? So there are some of the features like that, like handling flaky tests. Some of the tools that, you know, that we mentioned, test containers, you could you know, car, you know, write a framework which will do for you. So HyperExecute is one tool that you know, does that. And there are many other tools. So if you wanted to hear more about HyperExecute, you could talk to me and talk to my colleagues, Parsh. And we have you know, uh, uh, intelligent uh, support system that does everything. And uh, some of the, just to go back and uh, you know, reiterate what, what we saw in terms of orchestrating. So what are the things we saw? Ephemeral environments, and then distributed. distributed tests, and then test data, and lip taking test. Good. So, how many of you want to add more onto it? These are some of the things that I've seen, which are common. So, I wanted to put it here. Is there anything anyone want to add more? So that these are the things that you should look for. Because I'm sure you should connect the dots, right? What we have seen before and now. These are the challenges that you, challenges we have already seen. So these are the things how we could overcome it based on the tools that works for you, isn't it? With that, I want to leave with a message saying, quality is an act, it's, it's not an act, it's an habit by Aristotle. So we spoke about culture thing. So yes, good luck again. And I've been saying sarcastically good luck, but it happens when I mean, everyone has been in that space for a very long time. And, and you know, good luck doing it. And again, we spoke about quality is everyone's responsibility. So if you don't work for it, it can't be there. You will still be sitting at your desk and running the same script or being the same person, you know, having the same skill set. There are a lot of companies who are asked for QA ops. There is a role called QA ops. I was surprised. Oh, really? Okay. What is QA ops? I'll let the job description address everything that an ops person can do also. That's another thing. So industry will move on like that. They'll come up with intelligent, um, you know, new job titles for that matter. But what are the things that we could do so that, you know, we can, we don't have to don't rely, you know, depend and reliant on other teams, right? Advocate for quality. So coming back to that picture where I showed about testing at every stage is very important. Look at the picture again after I share my slides on the path to production. Make sure you know what test to run at what stage. And first and more importantly, use tools that works. Not because some tool is famous. All right? That's what it matters. With that, thank you so much for everyone. So glad to be here. Um, any questions you may have, uh, you could do it now or after. Um, session. Thank you, thank you. I'll take a photo. Good? Do the photo again. Yeah, sure. <laughs>